welcome to The Hive Podcast, a show that helps inspire you to pursue your passions and ambitions. My name is Jared Spink and I'm your host. I'm a photographer, videographer, and entrepreneur. Join me as I sit down with other entrepreneurs and creators to learn more about their process, how they built communities around their brands, and the experiences they've had along the way. I hope that these conversations inspire you to pursue your goals. You're listening to The Hive Podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to the Hive Podcast. Thank you for listening or watching. However, you're consuming the, the podcast. I am glad you guys are here this week. I have a great guest, as always, in store for you. So let's just dive into the episode and welcome Matt in vision to the podcast. What's up, Matt? Hey, what's going on, Jared? <laughs> Thanks for coming on the show, man. Thanks. I appreciate Wait. it. Um, Matt, you're you're a fantastic photographer, very, very talented. Uh, when it comes to product photography, uh, I think when I looked earlier this week, you had over, I think it was at 77,000 subscribers on your Instagram account alone, which is just, it's, aw- it's just mind blowing because you've only been doing it for, for what, like three years? Exactly. Yeah. Something like that. That's awesome. So for, for the guests, I mean, for the guests, for the listeners that aren't familiar with you and, and what you do, how would you uh, kind of describe yourself as a creative and what you do on, on Instagram? Um, I guess you can say I, I like shooting products. Um, I'm trying to incorporate more like lifestyle shots just, just because I've been shooting the product stuff for maybe two, three years now. And, you know, it surprises me because sometimes I, I feel like how do I still have ideas shooting the same things over and over because you run out, you know, but I'm not as consistent as I was when I started. Um, when I first started, I mean, it was like, I don't miss a day. I, I think I went for almost a year and a half straight without missing one day of post. That's, it was like my everything. That's so hard. Yeah. <laughs> it it, it you, was really difficult. Did you schedule posts in advance or would you, would you manually like go into the app and upload and do your description and your tags? Uh, no, I didn't schedule, but when I first started, I would have maybe two or three posts lined up, but never the caption. I may have like a shot that I like, uh, let's say for like today and then one for tomorrow and maybe the following day, but I'll come up with a caption usually either the night before or the day of. Okay. You know, yeah. And I was on a strict schedule. It was like 930 AM central time every day. Like I would not miss it. If I miss it by like 45 minutes, I'd be like, oh, darn, you know, but <laughs> would I you try skip to be it then? pretty consistent. No, you wouldn't, right? Uh, no, no. So um, we're going to dive into everything that you do on Instagram and your creative journey. So let's start there. Let's talk about how you got into it three years ago. Um, what made you want to start an Instagram account that, that focuses on tech products? You know, that's funny because... Um, I didn't, I wasn't okay. planning to create an account, you know, focused on tech. It was more like I wanted to, you know, it was, it was super random. I told my wife one day, I was like, Hey, I want to create, you know, an Instagram account just to share my love for like photography, you know, things that I like my hobbies, maybe, you know, tech or, you know, some brand name stuff that I, I like, maybe a little bit of fashion and stuff, but I had a lot of tech products already and that made it a lot easier. So I started with that and when I saw, you know, how the audience kind of react to some of my, my photos, my products, and that, that kind of what, that's what drove me to like, just keep it with this tech stuff. And then of course it ended up being just Apple products because I tried shooting other stuff. Like I'll shoot my cameras or like my camera gear, you know, and I didn't get the same feedback, but when I threw up like a bunch of Apple products and, you know, I got a lot of attention for that. And I was like, you know what, maybe I'll, this is what I have to do. I'll, I'll just keep shooting my Apple products in different environments and, um, and, and it was really just like that. I had no plans. I didn't know what the community was about. I didn't know there was a community. I was like, I'm just going to share my photo, create an account one day and boom, just started uploading. And it was like that. <laughs> That's awesome. And did you see growth immediately? How, how long was it until you started seeing the numbers start to trickle into the account? Um, when, when I started, I think it was, um, July of 2019, I feel like I feel like growth was a lot easier during that time. And so maybe at about by the end of that year, my numbers will start, they started climbing. I, it climbed pretty fast. I mean, I think, I think in six months, maybe 15, 20 K 
something like that. It, it was really fast. And I was like, wow, this is crazy. Like, you know, maybe I'll hit a hundred K next year. And then, you know, I always blame it on the algorithm just because like, oh, things are weird now. It changed, you know, and, and, and I've been on Instagram so much for the past three years that I've noticed like which months things are changing. Mm -hmm. You know, like you start taking notice. You're like, okay, if I drop this photo, it usually gets this amount of like or engagement. And then all of a sudden it changes. And I'm like, oh, that's odd. A photo like this usually always gets attention. I think that'll be fun to to dive into in a, in a little bit, talking about growth sure. on Instagram and how to leverage um, algorithm changes and how to how to keep up to date with them. Because I agree with you, like three years ago, um, it was a lot easier to grow a lot faster on Instagram. Uh, your yeah. stuff would get a lot more views and get in, a lot, uh, in front of a lot more people than it does now. But there's still ways to get in front of people now and, and still leverage um, what you're creating on, on the platform. Now, I think what's really cool, if I remember hearing this right, you were on the Coffee with Creators podcast, um, which is a fantastic podcast. Yeah, I, I, I love those guys over there. But you were talking about how you got started. I think you started with just like a Canon M50, right? Correct. That, so I think that's so cool. Like a lot of people feel like the gear holds them back. Like I, I, I can't have a successful Instagram account or YouTube account or whatever because you don't have the right gear. But like a Canon M50 is just a crop sensor basic <laughs> camera that you pick up at Best Buy. There's, there's really nothing special about it, but it's still a great camera. Um, right. Did you feel like the gear was holding you back or were you amped to just start with what you had? No, not at all. I thought that was an amazing cool. camera. And I, I still vouch for it now. Like when people ask me like, hey, I got, you know, X amount of dollars. What camera would you suggest? I'd be like M50. I've gotten at least three people buying the M50 when they wanted to start out. Um, you know, I like it. It was really small and I didn't really want anything big. You know, I've, I've had the 70D, 80D, and then from the 80D, I went to the M50 because I wanted something more for travel, not really to shoot content or anything. Um, but that's the camera that I had. But I also had a, you know, a pretty expensive lens on there when I started off. Um, I had like the Canon EF 50 millimeter 1.2. And I had that thing. It looks funny. It was like giant on this tiny little camera. And that's all I shot with was the 50 millimeter. Um, but I thought that camera was great. And, you know, I have to stand a little bit farther away to shoot products. But you get that nice, you know, depth of field from it. And um I was never like, um, I need this equipment, I need that equipment. But when you start off, but eventually you're like, huh, I want this, but how come I'm not getting that? And then that's when like lighting came in. Yeah. I think that's when I first started, you know, I, I shot with all natural light at the beginning. I didn't know anything about lighting. I just had a couple of windows. So I knew what time of the days I should shoot in this section or, you know, if it's like late afternoon, oh, I need to be over here. Um, but we can get into that later because I have a lot of funny stories about that, like uh, chasing the light, as you would say. Hey, that that's a that's a good name for a podcast right there. <laughs> you should start chasing a podcast, the light. chasing the yeah, light podcast. I have a whole like like a whole philosophy on it, and I tell my wife all the time, and it's 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 a pretty funny story about. So basically, I I know where all the what time of the day and months and like seasons is best to shoot at what area in my house. That's awesome. That's hilarious because you're right. I mean, lighting is so much more important than I don't want to say anything else when it comes to shooting, but it is one of the most important things. Like you said, you you had a good lens on the Canon M50. Having mm -hmm. good glass is far more important than the camera body itself because camera bodies come and go. They get updated almost yearly now, but the lenses right. don't get updated yearly. They come out and they're out for years and years and years because good glass holds up in value and quality Definitely. if you take care of it. So um, right. let's dive into that. Like, so you started off with the M50, um, a really good, really good lens and natural light, which is great. Like I love natural light, mm -hmm. but you still got to learn how to leverage it. And I think that's probably where that the, these stories start to come into play, chasing the light, because you got to learn how to leverage natural light. Probably why, you know, all the best places in your house to shoot and at what times and at what months. So uh, let me hear some of those stories. Let's hear some of the stories about chasing the light to get the right lighting for those product <laughs> shots. So when I first started off, like, um, okay, so, you know, I shoot like the iPhone, the iPad, the MacBooks. I hated reflections. 
Okay, so if I was shooting the iPad face up with the display on, showing off a wallpaper, I didn't like it to reflect. That's how mm -hmm. I started off. You know, I was like, oh, I need to move this around. And then, you know, I started realizing, okay, at 8.30 a.m., the dining room during the summer gets the most light. You know, and then after that, but I didn't realize that. And then as the months go by, I'm like, wait, where's my lighting? At 8.30, it moved. You know, and then later I realized, okay, in the summertime, my office has a small window. I'll get good lighting from there from 10 to maybe 12 or 9 to 12, you know, and then I, so that if so each day when I wake up, if it's between this time, if I want like the light to come in, this is where I'm going to shoot. I'm going to shoot in my office. And then if I if it's, in, you know, in the winter time, the dining room gets a lot of light and then the living room. I didn't like having reflections. That was the main thing. I was like reflections were like bothering me. But um i discovered um you know this is a good friend of yours uh michael soledad i mean the way that guy plays with lighting like you know he really inspired me i was like wow like he he always uses little window blinds and you know it shows like the little <clears throat> the little lines on his photos and the shadows and he uses reflections a lot and that's when it was like a turning point for me i was like wait i should use these reflections because what what that does is um it makes your photo kind of stand apart from a good photo like a lot of people can take good photos, but to make yours kind of stand out, you got to add that extra, you know, that, that extra oomph to it. And so that's when I was like, okay, I need to, I need to make it different. Look for reflections and, and little spots where the lights are actually coming in. When I first started shooting, I didn't shoot it like that, where I didn't utilize like the actual sun rays hitting a product. I just wanted it because it was bright. That was it. It was like using a softbox. Gotcha. Yeah. You're just using it for exposure. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Just for expo just a well exposed photo, I didn't pay attention to like, you know, these shadows that it casts actually creates a better looking photo. And I didn't realize that till a little bit later. I mean, I think if I looked at my photos now, a good six months, then I was like, Oh, wait, that's how you should do it. You know, it just it looks so much better. And I started doing that a lot, just chasing all the windows. And, you know, I talked to my wife about the light all the time. She's like, Wow, that's crazy. You're like, you know, you know everything about the lighting. I was like, yeah, you start shooting at the house so many times, you know, in every single spot. I know what time like of the month or, you know, the, the bedroom has the best lighting and so forth. Yeah. Light, lighting is so important. Like if you looked, if you looked at my scene right now, like in, in my office, it's, it looks dark in here, but there, I think last time I can there's like 12 or 13 lights on right now. And it still looks really dark in here, not in person, but at least in, in, in the camera, in the frame, it still looks really dark. So, uh, lighting is so important. I, I, there's, there's a big difference between lighting for exposure, like you were doing and then lighting mm -hmm. for exposure, but also throwing in additional light for effect or for those stylistic looks that you're looking to get. So, um, what were you, like when you started to invest in, in lighting, what were, what were some of the f very first things that you picked up? Oh man, like super cheap stuff. Like I went on Amazon and got like a, a soft box and then it was like, it held four like, you know, led bulbs, like the E 26s. I went to home Depot. I bought, um, I think some five K bulbs, you know, daylights. I put four of them in there and then it, what's cool about that one, it has like two switches. So if you want two lights on or, or four lights, you can switch it off, but it's not very bright, but for product stuff, it's okay. You just put it really close to the product. And what I use that light for mainly is to light up the shadows. Um, you know, when I had the window light, I'll, I'll let that light up one side and then I'll use this one to light up the shadows. Or if I'm shooting at night, that's all I had was just one light, you know, cheap little stand. And I just moved it around. And then I got to a point where like, that's all I use. I was like, oh, lighting's cool. I'm just going to use this. And I stopped using daylight as much. And then slowly, you know, I started combining them together. Okay. So let's fast forward now. Let's talk about your setups when you're, when you're like approaching a product that you're going to shoot. Um, what's your, what's your uh, like initial workflow when it comes to shooting a product? Um, I guess just walk me through, you know, you get a phone and you want to shoot it. What's, what's your process now? Uh, sure. So things have changed a lot because, you know, ever since my son was born, I don't get to shoot during the day anymore. I don't get the daylight. Um, and then I have to go to work because I actually have like, you know, a main job this is just kind of like a side gig so when i come home what i'll do is i'll 
in the morning when I take care of him, I'll look around the house and I'll find little spots and I kind of plan it. And I'm like, okay, what am I shooting today? It's always good. If it's an Apple product, it'll be like my MacBook, iPad, maybe iPhone, AirPods. They always look good together and it's, it's easy. Um, so I, first I'll look around like the shot I did recently. I looked in the spot in my office. I was like, hey, that looks pretty cool. I have this LED light behind there. I would set up the products first and then the lighting afterwards. And, you know, so I have that shot. I used three different lights and, you know, both of them are from Aperture. I used the 200D and then I used the new uh, 60D. And the 60D, it's like on 10%. It's barely on, but it's just enough to show like cast a small shadow just to make it look like it's not just with a softbox. And then the softbox I put very far. And then I use an LED tube light as like a, a background light. And, oh, and I, I shoot with the tripod almost all the time. Um, I don't like doing that, but I want it to be like, you know, perfect quality ISO 100. I don't want to worry about me shaking or ruining the noise, which it doesn't really even matter because for, for Instagram, you can't really tell anyways, but I've just gotten so used to using a tripod. I use it all the time. That's good advice. I mean, that way you can always tweak your shot and you know, nothing's happening with the camera, no vibrations right. or anything. You're going to get like a very sharp looking image. Um, what I'm amazed at when I look at your account is the consistency of the look and feel that you keep no matter what you're shooting. Uh, kind of, you know, what's your, what's your secret, man? Like when it comes to keeping that, that consistent look and feel, but still mixing it up. Like you got the same feel to every image, but not every image is, feels the same. If that makes, makes sense. Like they're not the same exact images, but there's this really cool aesthetic that goes through your whole feed. Yeah, you know, personally for me, when I look at my feed after seeing some other people's, like, um, I, I really like some other people's minimal feed where it's, it's really clean, uh, barely any colors, black and white almost, with a little bit of brown. And I look at theirs, like, man, theirs is clean. And I look at mine, I'm like, mine's a little messy. It looks pretty complex. There's a lot going on. But that's been my style since the beginning. Um, I did change. Uh, when I first started, my grid was not that clean. I didn't know how to edit with Lightroom that well. I've never even used Lightroom, to be honest. I had to learn that along the way. I, I was mainly a, a Photoshop guy. And I was doing everything with Photoshop at the beginning. And I didn't use the iPad. I was using my MacBook. And then I slowly, I was like, you know what? Let me try using the iPad to edit. And then I taught myself how to use Lightroom, which wasn't too hard. But the color temperature, I think, is what's most important to keep that, that grid cohesive. And I decided to go with the, uh, the cool tones just because my house is already set up for that. I, I never really cared for the, uh, the warm woods, uh, colors. I think it looks nice. It's just, I didn't have a wood desk. Everything was kind of white. So it was, it was easier to keep it on the cool tones. And that's what I did. I kept it, um, like that throughout my account. Although in 2020, I was like, you know what? I want to make mine a little bit different. I added like a, a purplish hue to it. And when I look back now, I was like, why did I do that? You know, it looks weird, but it, it looked, it looked more cohesive, but then it looks clearly like you edit that photo to make it look purplish. Now I try to keep the colors a little bit more true, I guess, true to life. I don't want to alter it too much, but at the same time, there's always going to be a little bit of hint of blue in there. Okay. Blue. And, and of course, and try not to have too many crazy colors, like, you know, reds or oranges, but you know, uh, wood tones, I've been adding a little bit. I didn't have that before either. It was just black, white, gray. That's it. Yeah. Like, I know. think that what's really cool though, is when you keep a cons like such a consistent look like that, when you do change it up, let's say you did do something dramatic where you threw something red in there. Like just mm -hmm. if you wanted to get like something really to pop, it would catch a lot of people's attention because that's just not what you do. And that's like, so there is yeah. a neat little trick you could do there where if you wanted to get more engagement on something, that you threw out there is you could put like a drastic change, but still make it subtle enough to where it, it still fits. Like, I guess if that makes sense, you know what I'm kind of talking about, like throwing in one object that's red. Yeah. That's it's happened before um, by accident. I didn't do it on purpose, but I, I saw this, I had this wallpaper on this, on the iPad and I liked it a lot. It was like red and I threw it in there. And then like, you know, weeks later you can clearly see like, Whoa, that like just, comes out at you because it was just like bright red, you know? Yeah. And also like, um, another thing is like, I used to shoot like a uh, dark photos and then light photos. Now I just kept it all light. So every once in a while, when I do like a dark photo, people would be like, Whoa, 
this is a dark shot. I didn't expect that from you. I was like, well, I, I liked it. You know, I, I like doing dark shots too, but I don't want to throw it in there now because then it'll mess up my grid. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> yeah. So I was like, even though I like shooting the dark shots, it just has like a completely different feel to it. Yeah. Um. Uh, the weird thing is though, for engagement, light shots get more attention. I don't know why. Um. Dark shots for some reason they don't get that much attention, even though they look awesome. You know. Yeah. I wonder. I would love to like if any, if anyone's done research on that. Um, there's got to be an article out there somewhere that just dives into what pops more, and maybe it's because of like the dark borders on the phone and the screen. Something light pops. I I don't know. I, I'm I'm curious because I see I see that more often than not that the light photos. I mean, even as just someone that's scrolling, like something light catches my eye a lot more than something dark, where it kind of kind of just blends into the phone more. I guess I I don't know. That, that's interesting. It'd be cool to dive into that and, and figure it out. I'm sure yeah. there's so, some weird thing behind it. Yeah, it pops it's the way our brain works or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so overall, I mean, you've been doing it for three years. What What is the goal with the account? Is it just to have fun or is there, as, as the account's grown, has maybe some goals st- started to be set on trying to trying to make something out of it? Um, I am not the type to actually set goals like that. I'm pretty, um, I keep it pretty real, pretty realistic. Um, I should be setting some goals, but, um, creating the Instagram account, it led me to creating a YouTube account last year. And and that's where things got kind of interesting because never in my life I'd be like, oh, I'm going to have a YouTube, YouTube channel. I, I, I didn't plan on it, but I had an idea for a video. So I was like, you know what, let me film this and put it on there and see what happens. And I think my account had, I might have three subscribers, you know, a couple of friends found out about my account. And I, um, anyways, I don't want to get, you know, off subject, but the, the plan is to maybe grow the YouTube account. You know, I don't know about Instagram. Instagram is cool. I get bored of it a little bit here and there because it's repetitive. Um, I do like making reels though, the videos like, um, it's something new and it's really just for me to practice and throw on there. And then I take that skills, th- those skills. And I really want to apply it to more YouTube because I feel like if you are going to, you know, be in this social media game, I think YouTube is the way to go. Absolutely. I, I think everything so too. else I mean, is for long term. Like, yeah. For long term, like you want to make a career out of this. I think YouTube is the way yeah. Instagram is for fun. And, but, but it helped, you know, it kind of got my foot through the door with, with uh, YouTube and I was able to drive, you know, my audience over there to kind of get that, I guess, jump started. I guess. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have that many videos on there, but you know, my account from that one video that I created where I, I did like a, I rearranged my office at the time and, um, it took off. It had like, uh, it was like 300,000 views in like, you know, a few months. And I was like, wow, like, you know, and then it unlocked my, my partnership with YouTube, you know, and I was like, and I got AdSense. I was like, wow, this is cool. I got this in like a month, you know? That's awesome. And then, That's awesome. I loved your, uh, your smart home tour video. That was a great video. Yeah. That took off actually recently too. And the funny thing about that one is I spent about two weeks filming that, by the way, I used the iPhone for that because it was just so much easier. I filmed everything on the iPhone. It took me two weeks to put it together. I upload it and then nothing like a month goes by. I'm like, no one's watching. I told my wife, I was like, man, I spent all this time on this and nobody cares. <laughs> and I just left it at that. And then another two months go by. And then I was like, whoa, I'm getting some views here. And then when it comes in, it comes in like a lot. It was like, you know, I was like, I was looking at it. It's like, oh, a thousand views. And then I look in 5,000 and then it was like 10,000. And now it's, at, I think 250,000, 300,000. And to me, I was like, wow, that's cool. You know, yeah. it, there's gotta you be some seasonality. It's weird. It's got to be some What's seasonality that? to that video, right? Be like when people are home more, they're probably thinking about smart home devices. So what do they do? They go on YouTube and then your video gets suggested after a couple others or they find it. And yeah, there's got to be some seasonality. Maybe that's why it's coming in. in it the is. Waves. I think the holidays. Yeah. I think it was right, right around, right before Christmas just started, you know, blowing up. So when people are starting you know, thinking about spending money on their homes, you know, and, and exactly. Gifts. Yeah. Um, so you, you brought out, you, you brought up that you're, you're kind of testing out Instagram reels and let's talk about Instagram and some of the changes they've made. Um, what have been some of the biggest changes you've seen since getting on the platform three years ago and really taken off? What changes have you, have you seen since then? 
Well, for one thing, uh, I, I know like these numbers shouldn't matter, like your likes, but to mm -hmm. me they do because they kind of determine like, you know, usually, when, you know, it doesn't take much for someone to double tap it. And most people, they'll double tap like a nice photo. They're not going to be like, oh, I'm not going to double tap that. So when the likes drop, I'm like, what, what's going on? Because back then I can post a not so good photo and it'll have like 3000 likes and my followers are way smaller than what it is now. Mm -hmm. Um, what I do notice is I feel like Instagram is trying to, um, they're trying to promote smaller accounts more often now. I don't know if that's just me, but sometimes when I go on the explore page and I'll see an account, they may have like three or 4,000 followers, but their engagement and their likes are pretty high. I feel like as your account gets higher and it might just be for me because I don't get, you know, the ratio is not as good. I used to pay attention to that. I used to, I used to tell my wife like, okay, so if you have X amount of followers and you get at least 5% likes, that's, that's pretty average. If you get 10% likes, that's really good. You know, so I used to follow that. And then I, I saw like my account, it was like that between five to 10%, you know, likes. And then anything below that, then it didn't perform that well. Yeah. Um, Some of the biggest changes I've noticed too, is they've relied more on su suggestion, even in your own feed. Like mm -hmm. you go to your feed and you expect to, you know, see everybody you're follow following, but then there's also a lot more like before you used to scroll and when you got through like all the recent updates, then you would start getting to like the suggested, like based on stuff that you like or people you follow, oh, you yeah, might yeah, like yeah. this account. Well, now it's, it's all mixed in with everybody. Right. So you're yeah. seeing less of who you follow and more of just suggestions on based on photos you like and people you follow. And now, you know, with the, the power of reels going straight to the feed, you see way more of that too than you do of, of photos. Like it's a lot harder. It's easier to get discovered. It's harder, I think, to stay in front of your your base if they're not actively engaging your account now. Yeah, you know, the, the reels, like, they, it's still a puzzle to me. Like, I've seen some accounts, like, I mean, they're just, you know, it's dark. They're filming themselves driving for two seconds, and it gets, like, a million views. And I was like, I don't get it. I'll spend two hours editing a five-second reel, and, you know... Nobody watches it. <laughs> yeah. I'm using, I'm using all like, uh, you know, the songs that are, are trending right now and all that. And I'm like, okay, like, why am I spending so much time on this? Like that, that's the thing that kind of drives me away. Like, why am I putting so much time into Instagram when I can be taking that time and putting it to YouTube? Mm -hmm. But for some reason, I just, it's like, I can't help it because I started with Instagram and I, I can't just like skip a week. Yeah. Like even now I don't post as consistently, but I, I rarely skip two days in a row. Like I think I might take a day off and then I was like, I got to do something. Yeah. I mean, it's good that you're getting into YouTube because as I think we all got into, a lot of us got into the, just this kind of niche of creativity by being drawn to photography, but videos Correct. become such a huge part of creativity now. Um, and if you don't, if you don't engage in video and start making videos, um, your content just isn't going to be as relevant. I mean, photos will still always be there, but you look at all these platforms, I mean, Instagram case in point, you know, they're not a photo sharing platform anymore. They've come out and said, said that like, yeah, you right. can share photos, but their focus now is going towards video and short form content video, which I'm not a huge fan of like repurpose your content, but I don't know if I would make content just for that because it like, like, it's short term. It, it's fleeting. It's not going to last forever. And this discoverability, right. like no one's going back to like, you know, that one reel we saw like two years ago, that was great <laughs> information. Let's go find that. Like no one's going to do that. Put your energy towards YouTube and, you know, repurpose some content for, for Instagram. But I even think, I mean, they got to change something because even with their focus now being more on video, um, I don't know if you've noticed this, but man, the compression on videos like sometimes it just like gobbles them out up and like spits them out and they just look like they look nothing like they do on your device after you upload them. Sometimes they just, they look like garbage. It happened to be once. Um, yeah. I don't know if it was the, the app I was using, but the whole video was glitchy. Like mm -hmm. it, it was even, it, it wasn't like that the quality is bad. It was literally glitching. And I was like, okay, it'll probably go away. It didn't, it just stayed like that. And, and I left it, you know, I was like, whatever, you know. No one's yeah. gonna watch. I mean, it, it's something I just made to made real quick. I threw it up there, and the whole thing was like glitching the whole way out. 
And then even my wife's like, hey, the video you, you uploaded, it's glitchy. I was like, oh, it's probably on the, the 13 Pro because it has like the 120 hertz display. She's like, really? She's like, I've never seen that before. <laughs> you know, and I just, I was like, oh, whatever, you know, I'll just leave it at that. I think when it comes um, to to video, um, you got to export for for the platform, right? So 4K, best resolution for YouTube, um, 720 or 1080 for Instagram, you know, because it, it's so small on such a small screen. Yeah that even a 720 video, 1080 video is going to look really, really good, crystal clear on Instagram on, on a tiny little phone. Um, you don't need the 4K and you don't need, that way you don't worry about them, uh, you know, compressing it and making it look like garbage. Right. See, I used to have people come to me and they're like, hey, your video came out really clear. Um, you know, what are you filming in it? I was like, just 1080p, 60 frames. Uh, most of the time I was like, I just use my iPhone. And they're like, oh, I was like, what are you shooting in? They're like 4K. I was like, you don't need to do that for Instagram. It's like, yeah. you're, you're overdoing it. You know what I mean? Like, it's going to be compressed anyways, because it ended up, their content ended up being a lot more fuzzier than mine. And I'm not even shooting the high res. Even my photos, I don't shoot at the highest resolution. I shoot at the lowest resolution. It's like 4K. That's it. Yeah. I think it's like 5K actually, but it's plenty for Instagram. It's plenty because, I mean, when you think about it, I mean, I even still now watch 1080 stuff on a giant TV in my living room and it looks great. Oh, mm -hmm. you, you take that same resolution and you're putting it on a small device. It's going to look great. <laughs> it's going to look great. Yeah. yeah pixels that looks, much smaller. I don't even shoot 4K for YouTube because I, um, well, before I didn't have the uh, equipment and I, I just feel like it takes up way too much space and it'll probably take longer to edit. I mean, the capacity is high, so I'm still sticking with just 1080 and I'm going to stay like that for now. I don't know if I'm ever going to go up to 4k. Yeah. It's just, <laughs> you don't need I'm to. already, yeah, I, I think it's fine. You know, I'm getting away with it. Uh, I don't want to take up, I'm already running out of space just from the 1080. I have all these external drives. I keep moving it out there because I don't want it, you know, on my MacBook. And my memory card is not that big either. So I have to unload the content every time I'm filming all the clips. So, yeah. and, and here <laughs> the bottom line too, right. Is mo. All right. Maybe because I'm an Apple fanboy, but most people are watching YouTube on a mobile device. Um, mm. And maybe this isn't just the Apple version of YouTube. Uh, but unless you go into the settings and to tell it what resolution you want to be watching the video at, whether it's 1080 or 4k, it's just going to do the recommended based on your current bandwidth. And oftentimes I'll go in and I'm like, why does this look like, why does this look like junk? And I, you know, tap the three dots up in the right corner to change the resolution yeah. resolution. And it's cause it's streaming at like, what is it? 320 360. or what? 360. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, no wonder it looks horrible. It's, it's like the lowest resolution you could possibly be streaming in. And most people don't even know that they're watching the videos in the lowest resolution possible and it's still yeah, it looks that okay to me yeah it, it, you know especially if it's something quick um it's weird because sometimes it does that to me even at home and i got pretty good wi-fi and i'm like why is it showing me like 720 come on like on i my think device, it's because you know? they're trying to save bandwidth on their end you know uh so yeah i always gotta go in there and, and i'll reckon i'll see that at 720 i'm like okay it's a little fuzzy this guy wouldn't upload a fuzzy video and then you know i change it like oh okay you know yeah, yeah. the had to go in there and <clears throat> select it manually. So what do you think? Do you think video is the future for basically all the platforms now, especially even Instagram? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, it's more entertaining, you know, and when it's more entertaining, you're going to have more, uh, you know, a better audience, I guess. Yeah. Um, I'm over here thinking like, what's going to happen with this, this metaverse thing? You know, how are we going to, like, I've been, very interested in that. Like what's social media going to be like when that takes over, you know, all my buddies bought like an Oculus quest. They're all playing games on there and doing whatever. And I tried it out. It's really cool. I want to get one for myself, but I just don't know if I have the time to be on there and I don't want to get sucked into it and be like, Oh wow, this is cool. But playing games on there, it's cool. I want to see how that's going to be when that becomes like more mainstream, I guess. Yeah. Well, what, what well, do you think about that? Have you looked into that stuff? I haven't looked into it too much. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know enough about it to, to really chime in on it. Um, I'm, I'm not huge into playing games, but I know that there's a lot of talk on just like the possibilities are almost endless with it, you know, cause it's a mm -hmm. essentially like what VR or AR or something like that. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's I didn't know much about it either. And then I, um, 
I went on YouTube. I was like, let me learn a little bit more about this. And there was a reporter from the Wall Street Journal. She's like, I'm going to join the metaverse for 24 hours. So come along with me. And I was like, oh, OK. So then I watched that video and I understood it. And I was like, oh, OK, that makes sense. Like, this is how it works. It's just mm -hmm. a little virtual world. You can go to meetings and stuff, meet other people, go to a comedy club, you know, hang out at a party. So she says, like, when you're there, everyone's an avatar. But but it's 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 the sound like it sounds like you're there because everyone it's talking. like ready player one in real life now yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of cool I, I haven't done that i've only played like you know little games here and there but um i think it's neat and i you know being with i guess um trying to be trying to be involved with tech and stuff i just want to be up to date about things you know although i just downloaded my uh, tiktok account today um because I was like, maybe I need to get on there, you know, and see if I should upload content over there. Everything I upload to Instagram, I'll just throw it over there and try to link them back to like YouTube or something like that, you know, yeah, just a way to market myself a little bit more. Well, Matt, to, to kind of wrap the show up, um, for anyone that's looking to get into product photography because you're just so good at it, what are some of the, the basic tips you can, you can give someone that, that really wants to up their game when it comes to shooting products? Um, so I, I like to find, uh, so I like to shoot at three quarter angles. I don't like to shoot flat lays. I like, uh, reflections. So, and also sometimes the lighting looks better on the other side of the camera rather than behind you. Um, that's like one of my main things. Um, mm -hmm. it makes it look that's completely different. So if I'm shooting the product in front of me, I like the light to be coming, you know, behind the product. Like on the okay. other side of the of the camera lens instead of behind you know naturally i would always shoot like where the light's coming from behind me and then it's well exposed but i like it to be exposed kind of funky on the other side um but I, it's practice man i mean i i didn't know what i was doing i just kept doing it over and over and over again i look back sometimes and i'm like whoa why did i shoot it like that um but i think it's just like people say it's practice just keep moving things around and um just shoot at home all the time it could be anything i shot anything that i had and then uh, wide or tight? Wide shots or tight shots? Tight shots. And then uh, horizontal or vertical? Well, I mean, if you're shooting for Instagram, always vertical. All right. <laughs> you can always crop yeah. it. You can always crop it, though. No, I, I just shoot no? it vertical. You just shoot it vertical. No, I just shoot it vertical, yeah. I just want it to be ready to go. I don't want to crop it and... Instagram crops a little bit anyways, but I keep it vertical. They do. They do. Especially I've noticed that for, for reels, like I'll export a reel at the right mm -hmm. dimensions and it still gets mm -hmm. cropped in a little bit. So just keep oh, that in wow. mind. Yeah. Interesting. It is. Thanks, man. <laughs> well, Matt, <laughs> hey, thanks for coming on the show, dude. Uh, if anybody wants to, you know, connect with you on social media, follow what you're doing, uh, what, what's the handles on what platforms? So, uh, Envision spelled really funky for Instagram. It's N V Z I O N. It's like N V Zion. I don't know how I came up with that. It was just coming up with some random letters. And then on YouTube, it's, you know, same thing, but it's Matt Envision. Uh, it's better if you just go to Instagram and check out the link in my bio and everything should be there. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Well, we'll have all that linked down in the description of the podcast and the show notes. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, however, you're consuming the content. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Matt Envision about product photography and Instagram and where it's headed. It was a great conversation. I hope you enjoyed it. If you're listening on Spotify, they now allow rating. So rate the podcast. I appreciate it. And as always, I'll talk to you guys next week.